Okay, I'm recording this time. Welcome everybody to episode six of The Big Three with Lilac, part two. And I say part two, you're only seeing one because- Oh, it's a secret episode, it's a secret uh, episode. You guys, you guys never, it's you guys can't see it. A super secret episode for my zero Twitch followers because I accidentally, I made a bit of a whoopsies, I'll admit it, I'll put that on myself. I hit the start streaming button instead of the record, uh, uh, start recording button for the first one. So this is Lilac episode part two. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know Lilac, he is a West Michigan Revel and Roll TO, um, as well as PR panelist. How are you doing, Lilac? I'm doing good, Finesse. It's, I'm glad to be talking to you guys a second time today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, given yeah. that we just went over this, um, we have a bit of a schedule. You know, We're going to try and talk about uh, different topics for our sake, but uh, we are going to talk about the West Michigan PR so Lilac can... Uh, Shout out his away. cities. Um, and then we're going to briefly go over Lilac's PR slides. Those will be in the description. Um, there's going to be a lot of links for this episode. Um, there's the Michigan PR, Lilac's Twitter, um, his slides specifically. So check the description. If we're talking about a reference that you don't see, it's probably linked on there. Um, and then at the end, we're going to talk about more general PR philosophies and such, what it means to be on a PR panel. Um, and we will kind of condense all that conversation to the end. So um, for the beginning, uh, about 20 minutes. Lilac, do you want to take it away with the uh, West Michigan PR? So, West Michigan PR, um, for those who don't know, I'm the head panelist of the West Michigan PR uh, team. Um, the West Michigan PR is basically just a, there's basically only like two big West Michigan cities, which are Kalamazoo, which is the region I'm from, and Grand Rapids, which is like the bigger region that most people know. How far are those two um, from each other? It's like about an hour. They're an hour away. Okay. So, which is so we're in the same sub-region technically, but we still, we still live an hour away. So. <laughs> right. Uh, this, West, this most recent West Michigan PR was a little scuffed because we only had 15 West Michigan PR eligible events, and that's due to like a variety of factors. What, one, of the, one of the bigger ones is that my tournament rubble and roll was canceled for like a month at one point, which yeah, um, which I don't want to get into it too much, but it, but it just sucked that that it happened. And then some of the other tournaments like, didn't just didn't reach eligibility a lot this throughout the season. But, the panelists and I myself still wanted to put together like a an updated list for the for the for the community to just showcase we've been doing we've been improving. Um, but yeah, just like cool. a disclaimer, like save on on that list, blue is on that list, the fills on the list because they mm -hmm. had not done that been on the eligibility for last season. And but the West Michigan PR did put did put through um, new like guidelines and rules so that hopefully this doesn't happen again. So. Okay. But yeah, from the bottom up, I'll just start one by one. Number 10, we had advanced placement who, I'll go a little, little bit and see people because I'm sure most of the people don't know who these people are. Yeah, uh, yeah. Advanced placement is a West Michigan Terry player. Um, funnily enough, we had another West Michigan Terry player who gets the PR in recent seasons. He's more, he's more well known. His name is Elliot. But he's playing more Oh, I know him. Now. He beat me at Big House like two years ago. I hate that guy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Elliot, move, move on to Freyer Pastor. He's playing Street Fighter now. Um, uh, good for him. Good for him. But um, Advanced Placement um, is a really young Terry player. This is actually his first season competing. And even in like this scuff season, so to speak, um, it's still pretty impressive that he was able to like rack up the wins he was able to do. And yeah, that's awesome. Still, like, still get on the on with PR for his first season competing, which is just pretty good for that context. Um, Challenger Said was number nine. Challenger Said is the West Michigan Sheep player. One of the two sheep players I know in Michigan, shout out to Induced. But, um, oh, yeah, that's my uh, guy. Seth's mm -hmm. been just getting better. I, I think Sheik's a pretty strong, technical, and hard character. And for oh, him yeah. to, like, did you see, like, start finally doing well with Sheik at the you know, lower to mid level is pretty impressive. And he's been racking up decent wins. Like, he has multiple pass wall wins. Pass wall was ranked pretty high on PR. Mm -hmm. um, and he also beat Lemon Knight, who I think a lot of these Michigan people know. Lemon Knight's mm -hmm. met, like, yeah. Ryan Arbor. Pretty well so, respected. Shout out to Challenger Seb. Um, number eight was Casper. A lot, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with the name unless you're from the Smash 4 era. Um, old Smash 4 Ryu player. Um, uh -huh. Was really good back in Smash 4. But, um, oh, came back, yeah. Recently came back in the past like year and a half. He plays in Center right now. And he's been picking up good wins because he, like, he beat Pasquale, he beat me. Mm -hmm. um, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't travel outside of KZ that much. But, so that's why they play, you thought that you have never seen him on the game region or something like that, unless you're like at level 100 where he was at. Which, um, but yeah, shout out to Casper. Um, CK47, I'm sure these people, these ones people know. Um, 
West Michigan Wario main, pretty consistent player. He he probably goes to the most West Michigan like locals out of, out of anyone. Um, he's just very consistent as a local top two place in like Knoxville or two. Um, and uh, um, and then number six was BZ. Um, another guy from like my separation of Kalamazoo, Drew, Samus player. He's just been improving. He, he's one of those players who um he was just you know doing coasting by and just like normal Samus game plan stuff because people just don't have to protect their power characters. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm but, people. Um, I'm people. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, he started, like, once people started, like, figuring it out, he, he started, like, adapting it, and that's when he got pretty good, which is, like, pretty good, um, or better, at least. Mm-hmm. And I will, I will say, from, like, BZ up, th- like, if this, uh, this was normal PR season, and, like, those people had qualified, like, Saban, and Saban, Blue Boo, Defoe, and like, Adorable Knight, like, six and up would have been on the, on the PR regardless. So, so these are people okay. who, like, legitimately had really good West Michigan PR cover season, for whatever that's worth. Um, number five is Ducks. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people know who Ducks is at this point. I, I kind of like Casper. I've been around since Match 4. Um, just very consistent Fox player. Um, has some good wins. Does really good at West Michigan tournaments. Um, we shouldn't be surprised to see Ducks be on with PR. He's been a staple for years now. Yeah, he's been around um, forever. Yeah, dude, I love Ducks. That guy's awesome. Um, number four was myself, which... I don't know what you're thinking. He's at the TO, who does awful uh, East Michigan Regionals. He's like one of two of your arcade games. <laughs> 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 um, but um, I, I, I actually did really good at like, the West Michigan locals last season. I, okay. I, I, got, like, I had a streak where I got top two like five locals in a row. Um, yeah, and then I had winning records on Pasquale, Wilf, and Guts last season. But, so do do you frequently team. enter Revel, Revel and Roll? Yeah, I, I enter my, my own tournaments. But. Okay. But I got, I got I got a lot of my wits like at like GR locals. I tend to do better at GR like not rubber and roll because it's just sensitive to the TO like tournament. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I always think I always think it's hard to it's hard to TO and run a tournament this time. I, I mean I'm at I mean I run tournaments because I like, I also want to play too. Like I I like mm-hmm. to do things, I think yeah. that, but like I still view myself as like as, like part of, like part of the competitor too. Yeah, yeah. For sure. that's I mean that's that's why I wanted to uh, host movement locals. You know I I, I hosted. Movement. I, I was one of the two TOs for movement for most of 2021, and it's because I just wanted to play more, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, um, I will say, um, well, this is a topic of like me healing stuff. I may or may not be running a regional season at the end of the season. So, word. Um, oh, okay. A little regional plug. That. That's exciting. Yeah, um, it's not announced yet, but I do want to like get the hype going on this. Where do you plan on doing it? I'm in uh, Kalamazoo. Or like gonna be at the same place that is Rebel, Rebel 100. So like, yeah, do it for West, cool. baby. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, also, quick shout out. Go, come to come to Rodeo Four this weekend. This weekend, that Saturday. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, anyway, move, moving on. <laughs> uh, Pasquale with that three. Uh, up and coming Steve player. He he had a he had a huge character crisis for a long time. He was a Bylist player. He went to Joker for a little bit. Mm. He picked up Steve honestly like back in March or back maybe April. It's the character um, crisis he, solver, man. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's the most broken character in the game. Yeah, oh man, I really um, click with this character. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, there's just something about this character. <laughs> <laughs> um, he he was like he was at first like not doing that good because because he was just doing Steve gimmicks and like Steve gimmicks on the surface like aren't too hard to beat. But yeah. when he mixed in Steve gimmicks with like actual player skill, like that's when it becomes really scary. And that's when Pascal started becoming really good. Like Pascal had a streak where he beat me like four times in a row. And it wasn't until, like, this most recent season where I, like, had a winning record on him. How do you um, like that matchup, Steve versus VSS? I, I personally think VSS loses, but I know a lot of people think VSS wins that matchup. Yeah. It, it, it's it's one of Steve's worst, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's losing. I just think it's well, like, one of his less winning. I, uh, I, also, I also think it's because due to, like, the damage disparity and kill disparity, because Steve right. does a lot more damage and kills a lot earlier, which makes up for the most neutral interactions he's going to lose. For sure. Um, that's just how I do it. I know a lot. I know a lot of Steve players think ZSS wins, but yeah, um, you, yeah. You you have to you have to make ZSS feel like a like a touch of death character. Yeah. And, um, so. and then pass ball at the Arcadium beat Aster, which I think a lot of what these people know him for. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great win. I didn't even know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He beat Pry at Card Cross as well. So. He did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember Drew that. and Drew Drew and I have a have a good memory of what some wise gameplay in that set. <laughs> some wise gameplay. Um, we were, was it was a, a bit. Of... I didn't do that good crossroads. Mm-hmm. But um, 
Anyway, uh, number two was Will. I, th- I don't know if you'll know who Will is. Um, most notably, last season he got ninth at Get Cook, and he had like really. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, he, he, I think he beat like real cool at that tournament. Okay. Um, yeah, and then he also had like a local win like Savon, and he beat Poison Jam or something. So Will had mm-hmm. a pretty good season. He he doesn't do the best like in region because a lot of Western people just know how to play Dilger at this point. Um, it, especially me, I'm like twenty and five or twelve all time. Um, wow. Uh, but but Wolf is very Wolf is like very scary scary when he like travels like out of West Michigan because he just he just beats people. Like, yeah, I would not know what to do against him if I fought him. I'd be confused. Yeah. Um, and then lastly was Pack Slash. I don't think Pack Slash needs much much explanation. He's a firm former GR, a performing former German PR player. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I got um, you. He's just living in Casey for for a little bit now. So. Yeah, and um, so I will say this is where um. For those those watching, if you want to see more about um, Pack Slash this season or other PR members, this is when you should pull up um, Lilac's slides. We will have those up during our discussion, um, but rather than going through it um, piece by piece, we'll kind of just uh, bring them up as we see fit and as topics come up. Um, and I think, um, unless either of you have more to say about West, this is a good time to pivot over I, to I was gonna, PR talks. I was going to ask um, one question. Sure. Like, Lilac. Um, so, so West breaks itself up into, right, it has two major cities and there is one PR that encompasses those two major cities. Do you think that East should have a PR? Uh, or, I mean, East kind of does. It has, like, Ann Arbor PR. It has, like... I mean, Ann Ar- there, there hasn't been an Ann Arbor PR since, I think, tw- uh, I think first season of 2022, I mean, so it's been almost a year. Well, East does have a PR. It's called the regular PR. <laughs> <Yeah. Hey! laughs> that, bro? Sorry, I had to throw a shot. I had to throw a shot. Funny is that all of East tournaments besides the movement are either are like college locals. So like if they just feels like True. local colleges do PR, but like the only East Michigan locals that aren't like college through money back colleges are like movement and DI down the river. So Yeah, right. It's, yeah, I think that's right. Cause, cause yeah. there's like um Bear Cave, L T U, um, EMU, yeah. which is a free event anyways. Um, yeah, like, and I'm sure there's like, a couple other. Oh, HFIL, the monthly, like. Right. Yeah, you can talk about. It. Yeah, but so. also, like West Michigan is a like it's kind of a, kind of a disconnected subregion. It's kind of like the same reason like why Michigan, why Michigan has their own PR. It's because like we yeah. live like two hours mm. away, from, where in East is like we're all like, like the main hub for Michigan stuff. Still, so, even though yeah. I think it's been doing more so towards Lansing, and I think that's like the move because Lansing is in the middle of everything. Yeah, it's it's right, definitely yeah, shifting yeah. west a little bit. Yeah. Right, yeah. It, well, it's, sh- it's shifting towards college. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's, what, was it, what was that? What was that lie like? I personally like that that the central focus for Michigan stuff is going towards Lansing, because um, that's where like a lot, a lot of the best players are. You know, MSU. Yeah, it's a more um, even drive. Also, that's where that's where like Grayson and Cage have been doing like a lot of their big tournaments. So. Mm-hmm. There's also there's just a lot of venues over there, um, even the ones that aren't um, at. Uh, at Lansing or MSU, there was one at uh, what Aquinas um, over in West that was a lot further over. But just like um, places, places in uh, Mid Michigan and West Michigan are just kind of opening up for like good spots to have uh, regionals and uh, local type events to have more people. But yeah, just like huge shout out to like the main TOs in general who like do all these big tournaments like Ray, Kajas, Grayson. Like those three in particular put in so much work this season. Yeah. I, I, I want to Good. get there one day, but like, I'm a, I'm a solo TO man. Solo TO. I'm like yeah. a solo TO team. That's hard mm. to I'll do my yeah. one regional a year. Yeah, it's damn near impossible to move up to consistent regionals just like flying solo. You got to have a, a squad for that. Mm. Yeah, and it helps that, uh, those, like, KJS has like Gushi, you know, like, like they kind of work together for uh, Gushi to bring the stream and KJS to run the event. Um, so it's even <laughs> harder when you have to TO and run the stream the whole time. Yeah, those those three are a big part of why Michigan is like such a big scene nowadays because they just put on so many freaking regional teams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shout out to them. And um, so yeah, now moving on from that, um, I do want to have Lilac. I want to have you kind of describe the um, the basics of a PR panel for those who might not know um, what it does, how it functions, who's on it. You know, shout out those names as well, um, and just kind of describe describe that for maybe the everyman who doesn't quite know. Uh, what a PR panel is. So, 
the PR panel is basically just a group of, I would say, reputable indiv individuals for, throughout the Michigan Smash community. Um, and these people can be like TOs, people who run regionals, people who are like in the know for like data, people like high end PR players who like who are pretty into the data as well. Um, and the goal of the panel is in terms of, like who's on it is to get a diverse group of people who can represent every sub region and every like, but also, but also every player skill as well. So that's why we like have PR players on, on alongside or, like PLs and stuff. Um, and that's why we try and get a representative representative from every region, which. I'll just shout out like each panelist and what they who they, who they represent. Yeah, go for it. Um, I would say the leader of the panel right now is Grayson. Um, Grayson is obviously repping the MSU slash Lansing area right now. Um, he's a he does, he does a lot of stuff for the panel. Uh, Ray, who's the longest, he's been on the panel the longest I want to say. I think he's Uh Ray's like repping like East, East Michigan, Southeast Michigan area. Um, he, he put on a lot of regionals just like Grayson has. Uh, we have myself from West Michigan. Uh, repping that, repping that area. I've done one regional, so I've contributed. Talent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, talent. <laughs> uh, Substational is repping Mid Michigan, um, and he's been on the panel for a long time too, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then we have Stancer, who is repping EMU. I, I know he's not like on their club anymore because I think he graduated, but he's still like involved. So. Yeah. Um, Number one EMU fan for sure. Yeah, and then. And then our PR players, we have Rob, who was a, with our most recent addition to the panel. He's been an excellent addition, um, and he he sort of represents that like that like grinder type PR player who like just goes everything and knows what everyone is. And then we have Zenodo, who's like that very high end player who just who, who like knows like, knows how to evaluate the data and knows how to, like how to objectively look at everyone because he's like just up there, you know. You're right. Yeah, he's just yeah such a sound player in his own right. Hey. And he's seen. I mean, he's known the scene for so long. Like he knows the ins and outs of, of, who's good, who, um, who's like on the come up, and, and, uh, and everything surrounding that kind of thing. He's just been such a, uh, such a granddad of the scene, you know. Yeah. So. I, 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 yeah, and even with stuff just like, pulling up to the arcade and watching and like talking about like his friends who've also been around or like the newer players, how they'll be doing. He's like still kept up through all of it. Yeah. I do think that this is like the best Michigan PR panel has been in a long time in terms of like, in terms of like the processes and like it's on the panel, like the diversity of the panel. Because I would say, I will say like a year ago, the, I don't think the PR panel was in a great spot. It was like a lot with like no West Michigan representation. A lot of like East Michigan people were on it. But we, we've kind of like rotated some people out and put some people in, and I think it's a lot better now. Mm. Yeah. It's definitely Great good to like, have the. Um... Uh, the regional representation um, for the sake of this is something that you've mentioned um, uh, like how the PR panel functions you guys kind of have like a working list of like all the people who you think have a shot you know yeah. and I think having more West and mid Michigan rep uh, representation it kind of uh, extends an arm to West players who are at that skill level and do have a shot that maybe would have gone entirely unnoticed before where now they might wind up as HMs or even low PR if uh they have a season that warrants it. Yeah. So, yeah, you 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 actually like I exactly you actually like great thing to talk about there because like people were wondering like well how how do I get considered be for PR how does the process exactly work well the way that it works is that that for you have to get on if you're not already on the radar like you are for already PR in the past it's hard it's kind of kind of weird to get on the radar the best way to do it is just get good wins and then yeah. get good results with the results and then you'll get noticed, and then you'll be, like, on our radar. Yeah, and it's kind of like beating somebody who is is on the radar is kind of how you get yeah. on the radar. Is like, exactly. Like it doesn't matter how many uh, two tours you 3-0 if you can't put a up a fight against PR players. For example, um, Cal was not on the radar, like, at the beginning of season last, last, last season, but mm -hmm. but after his Battle of Boise run, he got on the radar, and then I started getting it, and we started getting him involved. Right. So. Yeah, because yeah, that's uh, not it. That's not just a fringe PR player. That's Dice. He is the radar. You know, like that's that's a huge win. So something like that is gonna immediately right. just explode somebody into um, notoriety for a run like that. Because even like like before something like that, Cal had had a couple decent runs where I think uh, he had like a movement where he beat like like Broly and like Saturn and a few other players. You can see all of uh, his movement wins at the bottom of that, right? So it's like solid wins, sure. And then the dice win can kind of just propel you into a conversation that you weren't previously a part of at all. Yeah, so 
Yeah, that, that's, that's how, like, how the gist of how, how you get on the radar. And then, in terms of, like, how the list is constructed itself, we have we have seven panelists who weigh, who weigh the data, but we all have, like, general guidelines, we want, we all, the general, like, priorities we want to follow. Um, for the most part, we're all in agreement that majors, ma- ma- majors and regionals performances matter the most. Mm-hmm. But, like, the minutia mm-hmm. in between is where we have some disagreements, which is fine. Um, like, for example, I'm someone that really values, values the high in placements, but someone else in the panel may be like, well, if the run itself wasn't that good, then the placement doesn't matter as much. But I do. Right. And that's why they like, might think of that, of that placement. So, so you kind of put yeah. a high value on, like, the number of the placement, regardless of who they beat to get there. It's like, well, like you got I, nine. I kind, of viewed it, I kind of viewed it, well, if you place, like, four, if you, place, you, you did better than everyone below you, like, which is, like, which that should be worth something, even if you didn't directly beat those other players. Right. So, Right, that makes sense. Right, yeah, but I yeah. Also understand the other arguments. The other yeah, having ha- and and even just like having a, you know, getting getting fifth through winners is so different than getting fifth through losers, yeah. and you know, in mm-hmm. my opinion, like like the sheer number of people that you have to, um, is a lot, uh, yeah. harder. But at, at the yeah. same time, because of how double elimination brackets work, it you get the same placement. You know, like getting fifth through losers or through winners. It's, the it's same. harder. It's harder, but it's also not. You know, it's it's yeah, you can it's kind of funny. Winners, it, yeah, fifth for winners, through through if you're gonna fifth for losers, like that not fifth that fifth for losers often have to win like two more sets to get to that place. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah, and I right. think you mentioned you mentioned uh, Cal at Battle Before Boise as an example. I think that also works here, right? Where he had um, he came out of his round robin in first place. And then didn't win any more sets, but that's still ninth place, you know. Um, despite I think uh, Dice got like third or fourth. Um, seventh, oh, seventh, but still he got seventh, which is only one placement higher than Cal, winning probably double the sets, right? Like he had to win a lot more. Um, yeah, I think, I think Dice won a more sets than Cal. Then. Right. Like, yeah. I think Cal, like Cal, only won. Cal's only two sets wins that determined for Dice. And then I think he went oh, and I think he won, like I think he went two and three determined total. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Invitationals are weird. I mean, we talked about this like in the first, the first good part, but in, but it's like a, it's like a different beast because at a double win bracket, you have to work your way up to get a shot at the PR players. But at a invitational like this, you just have open shots. You just have free shots at all these people. Like you don't have you don't have to work up to it, which is like it's good. It's good and bad. Yeah. Um, it's good because like the invitationals give us like a lot more head to head data, um, and and give, give us like a better idea of like who's actually like doing well against the field. I like it because we can get us a little out of opportunities, but I think the double and the nation's part brackets are also like I think I think they're harder because they require more stamina because they're just there's just a lot more rounds that you have to go to get these players to get this replacement. Yeah, that's and another thing that I was about to bring up. In a round robin, in pools, you can still get winners top eight, or if, but if you lose twice in a double, you're out. Yeah, you mentioned stamina. That was one of the thoughts that I had because like in those um, uh, double elimination brackets, that's one of the things that the top players, that's one of their main advantages that they have over the lower level players is that they can just play and play and play all day and not slow down, maintain that same level of skill all the way through. Where if you get the round robin bracket, both players are coming in totally fresh. There's no burnout. And I think that's how you get um, some of those big upsets is that they're, they're both coming in hot. There's no burnout. There's no exhaustion whatsoever. So the kind of like lower level player who would maybe kind of start, start trickling down in skill a little bit sooner is going to be able to put up a fight, um, not only like you said, for free at the beginning of a bracket, but without the factor of stamina at all, and that's going to make it a little bit easier. Yes, yeah, so something like round, uh, like round robin or Swiss, not Swiss, but something like round robin pools. It's better for people that are better better at preparation. Um, someone that is very good at preparation is Straw Hat, and so any time that Straw Hat kid can know who he's going to fight next. It just makes him like exponentially better at that matchup, um, like play both player player wise and character. But um, and then um, I I I know we kind of talked about plus, but I kind of wanted to circle back to it and like, and, like go for it. Yeah, we can touch on stuff around. here, man. If it's a good yeah, topic, no reason not to. Yeah. Um. So, uh, there. So I, I think like the PR panelists do a really good job of like nowadays, at least nowadays, of like identifying problems and trying to like put it and trying to like put in like new ways to like uh, prevent it or remedy it 
Um, cause like even right now, like we're doing polls to like see what people like want the future. I'm sure you guys seen on Twitter. Yeah, I love to see stuff like that. Over four month season, or do you want like a off season stuff like that? So, like we're trying to cater to the people, but also like still try and see you know, what's best for the team as a whole. Um, so do you guys want to touch on that? What are you guys' thoughts on um, whether or not an off season is um, a good idea to have? I'm I'm a big anti off season person. My my overall, mm. overall thought process of it is there's just a lot of bad implications of it. First, like I think the biggest one is if if there's an off season and there's like a big regional tournament that someone's been planning for months and just happens to be in the off season, it's just gonna do worse in terms of entrance. It's like oh well, come to my big tournament even though it doesn't matter for PR. Like, it, like that's just super important. I think that, I think that's my biggest pullback on it. It's just like if there's a big tournament scheduled, having to be scheduled in that like week or two of the, of the off season, that's just super unfortunate. Yeah. And I just want to avoid the situation no matter what happens. <laughs> I think I, I I think that if you yourself want to take an off season, like go ahead, like please, like yeah. you know, yeah. you have all the freedom to do that. But why does everyone have to? Yeah. yeah. Especially if the, I, I, yeah, like I, I don't know. Especially if the PR panel wants to. I, I don't think that's. I don't think if someone if someone wants an off season, it shouldn't get in the way of other people's drives to do well. Like, sure. Like you can, if you want to take a break for you know, two weeks or three weeks, go ahead and go for it. But that shouldn't. But like. Someone else, the other people should be allowed to compete and go for like PR if they want to. Yeah, See, I'm not gonna. The thing about an off season is that for it to work, you have to um, uh, communicate that with um, a a lot of TOs and b as much of the community as you can, right? Um, um, ideally, with with something like this, you wouldn't have a scenario where like a tournament happened to be planned during the off season because the off season would be planned like a year in advance, right? It would be something that was like way way out, like way in the future. Um, and also something that I was thinking of, when I thought of the idea of an off season, the first thing I thought of was like, oh, they should put that like during um, like college finals, right? To kind of give like a lot of people a chance to, oh. to, to focus on something else and give them um, a spot where they don't feel like they're missing out on something that's also very important to their lives because they have to focus on this college thing. So that was always like my, my reasoning when I read that. I was initially like, oh, that seems like a fantastic idea because it just kind of collectively gives people a time to focus on something that's stress-free. And if you want to get practice and if you want to stay ahead, you can. Um, it's just, you do bring up the point, the events aren't going to draw as many people, so it's going to be harder to get effective practice. It's just a, it's just a lot of like implications and like, red t- and like not necessarily red tape, but like a, lot of, like a lot of communication has to happen in order for it to work. And then it seems like anything sure. like you just go wrong and most people uh, moment's notice. Um, and I, from what we see in the Twitter polls, it just seems like a lot of those people aren't, don't want the office to happen either. So that's, that one's probably not going to go through. That makes sense. Do you and, know what the then, uh, general consensus among top players is about an off season? Um, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Um, well, because the public poll didn't go that far, we didn't go as far as the poll top players. Um, okay. But I will say the public poll about the four months versus three months off season, because that one had a majority of the Twitter public voting for a four month season. Um, Grayson did go ahead and and poll like the top fifty in my database, um, and we're seeing more where, where that goes right now. I'm also it's funny that I'm also against a four month season. Well, I'm just I'm just more content with three month three month season. Yeah. Um, see, see, I think the four month or three month season it. it it comes down to like, what do you value in a PR, right? Because if you want the four month season, you're gonna have a, a bigger sample size. You're gonna have like, who is actually consistently most often the best versus a three month season is, is gonna lean more towards who is the best in your state right now. So it's, I think it's that just kinda, yeah. Yeah, you, you, that just kind of boils it down to like, what do you value? Do you value the longer term consistency or do you value this person who had three regionals in a row where he went insane, but then everything else kind of fell off. You know what I mean? There's a, there's yeah. a couple of reasons why I don't like four months. First of all, as a person who gathers all the data, I can't imagine having to gather another <laughs> yeah. four months. Um, <laughs> can't be asked yeah, for that four-month that, season. That's kind, of, that's kind of selfish, but also, like, it's just, <laughs> such, a, it's just such a big window to the point where there's just, like, maybe an oversaturation of data and oversaturation of players who probably didn't get enough to get PR. Yeah. Like, I think I would be okay with four-month season if we extend our PR to 20 people. Sure. Like, 15 to 20. 
But if we don't expand the PRs to 15 and 20, then I wouldn't have, then I just get those 15 for a four-month season. I don't, I don't think I'd be okay with it. Yeah, I would have to imagine an expanded PR. And I do think there's something non-selfish to be said about, like, you who is, like, the data guy saying, that's too much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you're not going to do it, then nobody is. So I think already, if, already if nobody's yeah, willing to do it. Data for ANSI like last season. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do, like, 45 or whatever. Yeah, wait, hold on. Right. This is, this is perfect that he has suspect open right now. I want, I want the viewer to see how, how much smaller the font gets when Gary switches to Anthony. <laughs> Switch real quick. Yeah. Just, dude. <laughs> Look how much more data he has than everybody else. Now imagine if everyone had like like closer to that than like yeah. Defoe. Yeah, it, yeah. There's just like such a like I get it. There are some players who didn't have a lot of data. Like if you gave them more data, then they might be like more consistent or something like that. I, I, I'm, I'm, but like I'd rather just stay the, with the way things are right now. I don't think it's a change that needs to happen, and I don't think it's like a huge issue. But yeah, I, I think the only thing, the only counter to point, uh, Lilac, is that is that you you would have to get more data per season, but you have one fewer season to gather data for. Like, you're always getting, collecting, if you're going to be yeah. on the PR panel for all 12 months of the year. Like, at the end of the year, you continue to have to do 12 months of, of PR analysis. So, like, the quantity doesn't change. It's just how many times are you breaking up the quantity of work. Yeah, it's not spread yeah. out. I mean, the, uh, a four months bulk would be like more than would be like more data than I, than doing at one point than I would do at any one point now. It's just like I think it's not yeah. Good, but. I think that mm -hmm. one day would take so much longer as opposed yeah. to doing it one last time. Um, well, like, I get I get the argument for it on the other side. I'm just against it. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm ready to talk about the players now. If you guys are. Yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit. Yeah, who? Yeah, take us somewhere. I wanted to bring up one more thing. I wanted to talk about like the PR panelists and how we usually like work to work well together. Sure. Okay. Um, we talked about it briefly in the secret episode, but I, I just want to bring it up again now. <laughs> um, yeah, every, everyone does a everyone does a good job, especially um, Grayson, Ray, Rob, and myself. I, we're in the most active in discussions um, and just like getting like updating what what what's, what's important stuff is happening, what issues are happening, what needs to be addressed. Like us four are the most active in discussions. Um, Suspational Dancer and Zenodo will chime in every once in a while, but for the most part, they're just like, they're just reserving their opinions and stuff for the end of the, end of the season, which is just fine. Um, and in terms of like people's like, people are like, I don't know how they, they value stuff, I think that everyone values stuff like very well. Like, um, every, like everyone just, like everyone's gonna have like a little bit of bias towards their own subregion, which is kind of inevitable. inevitable. Yeah. But with seven panelists, there shouldn't be like un with seven, seven panelists in the averages. There shouldn't be unprecedented bias with those with after the averages. What do you What do you think is like the the biggest source of disagreement among panelists? Like, what what factor gives you guys the most grief when it comes to like valuing certain things or whatever it may be? Um, as of, as of right now, Grayson Grace and I argued about this a million times, but um, right because right now Grayson is a big guy with a big like. Your path matters a lot for regionals, and if you don't, ha if you had like an easier path, then your place doesn't matter as much as the third reason. But I'm mm -hmm. more so like, if you did good at the regional, regardless of what your path was, then you still did good at the regional. Like, right? Okay. So the uh, argument is is generally placement versus good wins. Like, what yeah. what's more important? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that, that, that's just one like that's just like, that's like kind of a kind of a minor thing. There's also like some disagreement about how like among like how um how much certain things matter because like among like what matters more between like an open bracket or an invitational i i think open bracket matters a little more but mm -hmm. i can definitely see the argument for like people saying that that battle for ladies should matter more than one piece or something like that um but yeah and then um but yeah it's it's, it's but yeah everyone everyone does get put together like pretty like pretty good list from what i from what i've seen um some people so, like and the people who i said about who just chime in like the note in particular it's really funny because he he probably talks the least out of everyone in that in that in that, in that Discord. But he like puts together like a three page essay at the end of the season. But and, when and, he and, talks, and gives his opinion on everyone, and writes a whole paragraph for every player. And it's just it's really appreciated. But like you don't expect I never I never really, I didn't really expect that, to see that from him the first time around. <laughs> right. 
kind of comes out of nowhere at the end of the season. Like, hey, here's here's everything. Yeah, the is really smart. He he knows what's going on. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, that that was like the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of like the panelists. Oh yeah, so I guess uh, this is a good time to get into um players that um we think had interesting seasons. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there are, there are a couple things that we've mentioned about um like players that like started off weak and then uh, kind of kicked it into high gear um, later on, and then how that affects other players in terms of, like, how much do you value? I think one that we mentioned earlier was um, an early season save-on win in a season where he wound up placing, I think, six on the PR, but then um, seven, st- seven. S- started off kind of weak, you know? Um, I, I will say that, that for everyone watching, this is, this, my projections here are not how much the is going to turn out. This is just a list I submitted to the PR, so it's, mm-hmm. it's not going to be one-to-one, but it's going to be like something. So, mm-hmm. right. before we get into the uh, players specifically, how do you guys trim it down from like, like each individual panelist's top 15 to the top 15? Do you like... like yeah. Do you average it out between them, or do you just have to come to an agreement? You start arguing. <laughs> the, the... So, everyone submits a so this season we're trying to get everyone to submit a top 20 but in past seasons we've done a top 15 um and how it works is that we just take like if you're if you're number one you get 15 points and if you're number two you get 14 points and if you're number three you get 13 points uh, okay and, and it goes down from there and then whoever has the most points at the end is what determines the order that's that's how we did it last season we might do an average of season like we might just do like well this person got ranked one six times into a seven time it's a total of eight and that's an average of 1.16 or whatever right okay um, so, mm-hmm. so we might do that that way this season but basically basically it's just an average list between seven people is how the PR is and okay. if people end up tied then we just argue or they make an argument so. <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah or, a, t- actually, a tie sounds like a nightmare in that scenario especially between like you know we'll see with like two players that are so close to each other it's like how do you settle that yeah yeah how we usually try and do it is that whoever had whatever player had the most players rank them higher than that other player. That yeah. Sense? So like if four of the panelists had player A ranked higher than player B, um, then then player A would be above player B even if they were tied in the end. Okay. So. Which does happen because like some of the panelists put that guy like two spots lower than other people put like that. So. Sure, sure. So uh, which which players did you want to focus on, Lilac? You seem to um, ha- uh, have a few that you had in mind. Well, you, you, you talked about people who, like, started off, like, kind of cold, but then ended up finishing, like, really hot. Um, in my, my opinion, that goes Yoder, Copal, and Saban are all prime examples of that. Because mm-hmm. um, Yoder and Copal, but, like, they didn't, like, Yoder, we're looking at his result right now. Um, he, he started off with like, a few bad regional results, between good code for Lucid and Crossroads. Um, but then picked it up like a Battle Four Boys run, especially his movement one fifty one run. Um, yeah. He got to fifth head where he beat Dice, which was a huge run, huge win. But his big house run actually looked a lot better in retrospect because he got a save on win there, and save on ended up right. a better season as the season went on. Which so why, like you would retroactively put Yoder up higher. Yeah, so it's like his his big house run looks better now than it did when it yeah, happened, really. which I feel like would sound goofy yeah. to someone who like. Doesn't doesn't really follow things, but it makes so much sense to value that because it's like Savon clearly had that potential the whole time. He just kind of had to tap into it a little bit, so to speak. Well, with mm-hmm. contact, Savon was coming off a weak summer season, and he wasn't on, on the summer PR, which mm-hmm. is like a lot. Which like a lot of people thought Savon was not a good win in the beginning of the season, but Savon proved people wrong and had one of the good regional results in the middle of the back half of the season. Right. And Savon's um, Savon's bad season sparked that legendary KJS tweet about the Arcadian. Yeah. And then, see um, that? And then, the Savon so proved good. everyone wrong. That was awesome. Would, would oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about now. Um, Copal, I, Copal, I want to talk about the quick season. You know, similar spot to Yoder. Yoder. didn't have a great start to his season, but between movement, especially Big House, we got 129th out of 507. Yeah, that's a rough but, draw. Um, yeah. Um, he, he didn't do like amazing at his first couple of regionals this season. But at Movement 151 and DreamHack Atlanta, he really bounced back, beating, like, Sonito and Slushy. And he, he also had, like, two local wins on JJ throughout the season, which, which was also taken uh, into account. How uh, many times did they play? Is that a massive sample size, or...? They, pl- they played, I want to they played, like, five or six times. And okay. I know JJ definitely had the best of them, like, like, like four or five times. Okay. So it's not like uh, a Rob Tony sample size. It's, it's yeah. a little more trimmed. 
Because they play but, at like. But the ratio is similar. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Gopal was the other person I wanted to highlight who, like, and he's kind of in a similar boat in Savon, where, where I think Jad will beat Gopal at Big House, and that win at the beginning of the season wasn't looking that good. But because Gopal did so much better at the end of the season, that Gopal win looks a lot better now for Jad, which is like a good mm-hmm. argument for Jad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So how and much Savon similarly didn't do that good at the house, but turn it around with like three amazing regional placements at the end of the season. So. Yeah, yeah. Especially the crossroads and Battle for Boise runs where he didn't really get an FO for Yeah. Yeah, that crossroads run is phenomenal. You put Savon within ten miles of Lansing and he just goes nuts. All those yeah, regionals. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad Crossroads is still a big event despite their like the MSB eighteen not being there, being like a suspect of Hydra, Hawk, Trash, mm-hmm. uh, all those Arcade, all those guys weren't there. That's still end up being a big tournament regardless. Yeah, that's really that's happen. crazy. That like the people that you would think would be staples of a Lansing event weren't even there, and it was still a pretty a pretty great event. Yeah. Shout out to like Popol and So Good Pop and J Jock and Munition coming out after that tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, shout out to the HMs, I guess. Since uh, we're gonna be talking a lot yeah. about the players at the top of the top, you gotta gotta shout out your Poison Jams, your Asters, your Cows, like yeah. some a, so, some great seasons down there. Jams. There is 10 HMs who, if, like, you can maybe argue to be on the PR, but or if they had slightly better seasons, they could have been on this PR. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Which... I think, I, yeah, or if the or if for some reason, like, if the 15 sp- slot was like sort of open, and like for some reason Packslash wasn't here, I think there would be an argument for a lot of players um, in the HMs. But because yeah, I think be Pack, Pack, Packslash is like like uh, gatekeeperness. Uh, Packslash and uh, Broly, both of them just like really put a hard wall between the really good players and the close to go- really good players. I, um, I do think there is so. a slight gap after the top 15. I think like, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes yeah. there's a slight gap after the top 13 or something like that. Um, it just kind of worked out this way this season for me. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I don't I don't think in skill, I don't think that's like skill wise necessarily that these two are like substantially better than, than their, the you know, the HMs, but. But I think their season showed that they that they were the hard wall, that they were the gatekeeper um, yeah. this season. Yeah, thank God for those uh, um, those pack slash regional performances. I think if it wasn't for that, like deciding that number fifteen would have been a nightmare because there's a lot of the yeah. HMs that are like like really nipping at the bud, but he kind of just barely pulled away. Yeah, yeah, the suspect win. And the HMs were really consistent. But didn't have good wins, or some of the HMs had good wins, but weren't consistent. And pack slash just had the just had both. Yeah. Right. Yeah, ninth, oh, definitely. ninth at Lucid for Packslash really stands out to me a lot more than a lot of these HM uh, placements. Yeah, Lucid was Lucid was comparatively to a lot of the other regionals on here was a lot bigger. Lucid had like 170 people. Yeah, state Lucid was a phenomenal. Five right. different states. Nao was there, which was like kind of randomly was there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nao just you showing could... up in Ohio was the funniest thing. Yeah. Going to like an 11 person Ohio local, so good. And 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 the Packslash run is like kind of a good example of like. Oh, who'd he be to get there? But like Zandomo was playing really hot that day. He beat Robbie, um, and uh, and I, I forget who else he beat in winners. But I mean, like getting ninth definitely was not was no slouch uh, kind of run. Especially so. the yeah. Yash win, especially after the Indiana PR dropped like a couple days ago. The Yash win looks even better now because Yash got ranked fourth in Indiana. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yash is absolutely not not a win to sleep on. He's a super solid player. Yeah, yeah. Yash is gonna come up. He's probably the best PT in the Midwest. Right Mm-hmm. I guess door stops speed. Yeah, right. sure, sure. For special occasions, for Dice's Falco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it, is what it's, that's, I think that's, exactly. that's like the only two that's times I've seen uh, the... Dice, so. <laughs> sorry, what was that like? At Lucid, the PT didn't work against Dice. Dice got a better door stop speed. Exactly, exactly. I was so happy for Dice, <laughs> dude. That was, I was so excited. This is what I said after that. That was the rare occasion where I was very happy to not be on commentary for that set. I was so glad that I was in the crowd, like, like yeah, yelling at him. Before I can leave for Lucid, I was signed up for it and stuff like that. Mm, um, like, that I, sucks. I, I, I'm so sad. I, I'm, I'm definitely going to Afterburner, which will like scrubbed out to the next big event. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm gonna check that out too. Shout out scrubbed out, man. He does a lot for the Indiana scene. Scrubbed out, the Indiana scene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, just yeah. throw it like, over I'm his shoulder and him. drags it through the snow. <laughs> I love stuff now. Like, that guy's awesome. Me too. Just a good dude, too. He's, he's, he's like, so chill. He, he, he gave me one. free pizza. He went to 
he was he went to my regional got 100. The, the, the oh, did he actually? Mm. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. Th that's yeah. rad. That's rad. I know. Yeah, I don't, you, yeah, fair, fair enough, awesome. Indiana the holes is getting better, man. I, I think people are like like Indiana was bad thing with a with a thing for a while, but now they're actually like, good. <laughs> yeah. Who's at least like their top like four front to five really really good now. Who's who's above Yash? Uh, it was Grumpy, Risk Taker, and Reese. Oh, Grease. Okay. Yeah, because Grease got like fifth or seventh on this, I think. And yeah. Risk Taker was Risk Taker goes between Utah and Indiana, I think. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That and makes Grumpy sense. Um, do you guys want to talk about how uh, some stellar big house runs affected quite a few uh, quite a few positionings here? I see, <laughs> I see Defoe up right now. I was going to bring this up anyways, but uh, Defoe yeah. obviously a great player, but seventeenth at big house with Ned, Sam, and Padahito is a crazy run. Yeah, I um, yeah. some people might say I'm biased towards Zach because he was in the same suburbs as me, and I've known him for like three years now. Um, but I, I, but the both run at Big House is just so impressive. Yeah. Um, definitely the second best Big House run out of anybody after the suspect. Um, yeah, I would hesitate to call that bias. I think I very much value when I'm, when I'm thinking of how good a player is, is like going into any bracket, who has a chance to just like, like wipe the floor and play out of their mind and like beat everybody. And I think Defoe is a player that yeah. comes into every bracket with a chance to do that. And I think that's, he that's a very important thing. Ever. Right. Um, he he, I, he usually works weekends, but I usually just make the joke that oh I sh I, I I offered him to go to this tournament with me. He usually and he just didn't want to. <laughs> you know, he, right. he's usually busy. Um, but like I do understand the the like, the attraction point on Defoe. Like oh you got ninth at get cooked and seventeenth at BBB, so he shouldn't be like in the top ten, which I, which I understand. So like, but I do think like this season was definitely a PR like a PR caliber season, and he should be like at least flirted with top ten status. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Do you do you know who we lost to at BBB? Because I remember it being yeah, not bad players. Like, like Crash, SHK. We lost to, like, I think it was like yeah, it, it's like, like getting. Yeah, was probably talking about like, SHK because he was beating the crap out of Pack Flash at local the past like four, the past like, few weeks before that happened. To me, when I think of invitationals, I feel like like high placements should matter more. But low placements should matter less because it's like, you know what I mean? <laughs> what are you saying, dude? Because you can get seventeenth, you can get seventeenth at BBB, losing to what do you say, Straw Hat Kid, Arc D, and someone else. That's only PR level players, right? That is not the same as getting seventeen out of twenty four at like Revel. You know what I mean? As, as it's someone who also got so different. At BBB, I'll, I'll stand by that. that <laughs> right. 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 I mean, I mean, I would, I would equate like Defoe's like 17th at um, Battle of Fort Boise, similar to Robbie's like 13th at Crossroads. I think like, you know, like maybe, like maybe Robbie's 13th at Crossroads was even a little bit better. But I think it's sort of, it's sort of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's I would say they're about the same level. Robbie's better at Crossroads considering like the feel of the competition that was there that day. But, mm. but like, I think, I think that, that, that his 17th was like, more of a blemish on like a pretty face than the other way around than like yeah. than, like the trend that was supposed to happen that big yeah. house was the exception i think like yeah I, I i you know i i and that might be like my bias like from from history of watching defoe make pr after pr and so <laughs> i already like have have implicitly decided that he's going to be higher on the pr yeah but top five and all will see them so, mm -hmm. I, I yeah, I see that this number nine is being like, like lower than what I I, I would expect. You see, the, so. you see, that's the other thing. I look at the the seventeen out of twenty four. I think a lot of people, or at least this is what I do when I look at a placement for a tournament that I'm not familiar with. I I kind of think of it in like percentages. You know what I mean? Like if you get ninth at a tournament with like thirty people, you did better than this percentage of players versus getting ninth at a tournament with like ninety people. It's a better result. Um, you, you mm -hmm. look at that percentage, 17th out of 24, that's pretty ugly, right? But then you, like, you think about the level of player there and the level of player that he lost to, it's, it's, it's clearly not the same as um, a typical 17th out of 24 entry tournament. Right. Right, right, right. Yes. Then um, to touch on another stellar big house run, um, do you want to walk over to Suspect real quick? 
because that run was phenomenal. Even the <laughs> even his losses. That's game five to Shattuck and Mister E, both Wago Seiko. Both those players, like like high key. Yeah. Just yeah. One of my favorite moments from that uh, tournament is the. I will say though, if if Suspect did get top eight in the house, it would have been really hard to not put him number one. <laughs> yeah. Like. like yeah, because I mean, uh, like he has the consistency. If you threw in a peak like that, oof, that would have been nasty. Yeah, it's just like he does have the one blemish on his record this season where he got 17th in Lucid, but mm-hmm. that shouldn't take away from his big off run where he beat Tarek and he. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see. Yeah, he beat Lemon there too. Like Lemon, maybe I'm like under like underselling Lemon there. Maybe he's like higher than Black Lemon. But... Yeah, Lemon's solid. Yeah, see, that's the thing. Like, like a. Um, the seventeenth at Lucid isn't like that bad, you know. Lucid was a was a great tournament. That's not the worst placement for something well, like that. I I mean, for him, he lost to Ryoku and Straw Hat Kid. I mean, <laughs> right, right. It, it, it's it, these are. I mean, those are both like like XPR players, sure. and they're and for for you for you and me, like like well, oh my god, you know, those are those are good losses, but. If you if you want to argue yourself for number one, like, like those, it's, it's hard to it's it's hard to compare when the guy next to you doesn't lose to just doesn't lose to anybody. This yeah. guy, like, like, you see, that's the like, thing. It, if you want to get number one, you can't be subject to a bad draw. You know what I mean? We look at we look at suspects bracket and it's like, oh, straw hacky Ryoku, that sucks. That's unlucky. Tony couldn't like like if he right. got unlucky, it didn't happen. matter. It like yeah. like. You look at his bracket, it's like, oh, that sucks, and he's going to win anyway. It's like, it doesn't matter if he's unlucky. He just takes it. Yeah. Yeah, the only, I mean, the, the only the only blemish on Anthony's, uh, you know, season was that versus top five was losing. Just, I mean, uh, oh, other than yeah, that, yeah, his, 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 his dice, dice losses. Dice and suspect and mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, that's the thing. It's, yeah. it's like he's so ridiculously consistent, and then – like, in the top three, Dice has number all season, and Suspect has horrible matchup. But like, like just <laughs> but had but his it's number. still yeah, but he still lost it. Yeah, lost but more like, than one. Anthony won four regionals this season, which is like four times more than anyone else won. Yeah, right. Yeah. But you really have to, you know, hats off to that. Mm-hmm. Um, being able to just win, 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 win. At, whereas Suspect like only won, um, only one battle before Boise, where yeah. Anthony wasn't. Was not there. He, he was there. Okay, he was mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The suspect and dice. I also think we're just. Um, well, I mean, you can see right there zero P, zero non PR caliber losses for Tony. Right. Like he just mm-hmm. like was not at all susceptible to the big upset. Did dice have any non PR losses? I don't. Yeah, no. Okay. Did. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. But dice also went to like a third of the stuff Anthony did. Like or, or, like less than half at least. Yeah. Yeah, Tony having 26 events under his belt is pretty ridiculous. It is kind of weird that, that like, Dice and Anthony's results are slightly more similar than, like, Suspect. Suspect is kind of, like, this outlier between the three of them. Mm -hmm. And it sort of feels that, like, you should probably group Dice and Anthony together. Either it be Dice dice 3, Anthony 2, Suspect 1, or the other way around, Suspect 3, Dice 2, Anthony 1. And for me, like, me just, like, you know? I think the big thing that kills it for me is the 65th, the big house. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, I was gonna say like the big, the big house. You got, you got. If you look at that number, if you look at that placement out of context, 65th out of whatever it sucks because because how good stuff against me to that big house. But like in context, you look at the bracket path. And you lost like Zenodo and Lucius. I don't know who dice lost in winners. Yeah, that was so sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the dice Zenodo team kill at big house is maybe the like most biggest bummer of the year for Michigan Smash. I was so just sad I, about that. I, I think he beat Yoder. I think Dice beat Yoder at There were there were a lot of movement team think. kills at uh, I think or maybe Yoder had a play Zach. Yeah. I don't remember who he lost to anything else besides Dice. And I so been, it's like I like, did like, data but, mm. um yeah, that's like the main reason, and I do get the argument for suspect that one because it's it. I've suddenly enough. I I compared it to the Aqua or Spargo debate from like the mid year ranking. That was like, my Aqua exact thought. All the, all the wins, but you know he had the losing record to his to his number main competition for number one, and number one and number and another player something in this case 
also had the higher peak, which, which was Big Ops. So mm. I, I, I get the argument either way. I think if you put Suspect at one over Anthony, well, I would slightly disagree. I would understand it. So. I really do value uh, Suspect's peak at Big House. Like, that is, like, so important. Yeah. Tony and Suspect are, like, when, when someone in your state is playing against an out-of-stater and, like, you want it to be Tony and Suspect. You know, those two can can really just, like, kick it into <laughs> the next gear. I mean, between you and me, I would want it to be J. John T. <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm betting, I'm betting all the money I, I have that they don't know how to fight Kirby, bro. Like, yeah, no yeah. way, no way you've seen a Kirby. Well, so, cause, and cause now, that's the thing know, about a JJ yeah. set is that if you send him out there, you know, it's, it's like if he loses, it's like ugly, you know. Right. Because it's like right, yeah, if yeah. they know how to fight Kirby, it's, it's gross. Where, where it's suspect like, uh, and Tony are gonna kind of scratch and claw the whole time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the. If we had to send five to fight the aliens, who would we send? Kind of, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, well, do the aliens know what Kirby is? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Dude, if they do, it's cooked. <laughs> right? Yeah. It might influence my decision. <laughs> That's so good. Dude, um, JJ also had a good season, and he was actually my front world runner for number one at the mid-year point, at like the mid mid-season point. Yeah, I remember it's that. Just, like, his second half of the season kind of disappointed. And then, like, you know, he, did, he, he won good cooked at the beginning of the season. You know, Big Ops was good. Um... His West Wing Moves Miami wasn't that good. And his Dream Hack, well, his Dream Hack was also pretty solid, but his best win at Dream Hack was following up Cobalt. Oh, um, yeah. Uh-huh. Because Cobalt beat Sonido, which, and Sonido was supposed to play JJ. Right. <laughs> Cobalt beat which Sonido. Is, which is a hilarious winner's side, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Kirby, uh, Carol, Sonic. And, and Kirby comes out on top. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, JJ's funny. I, I, I like that guy. He's cool. Um, Goober, for sure. Yeah. Um, and he also, I, want, I do want to highlight that he went to, like, the pre-regional thing for Let's Make Me Miami, which is, which is Coney's kickoff, which, where, where, where he mm. and Jake. And so. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a great mm-hmm. one. That's a great one. Which, which, yeah, which I definitely think is one of the reasons that I think that, like, you have it right be over Rydra. Rydra. Oh, yeah, speaking of Big House runs. Runs. You know, his Big House was amazing. But, like, yeah. His big, right, his, yeah. Like, Louis Money and Comet, is so, they are, like, two, like, amazing wins. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he just he could never uh, close the it's gap. And you mentioned this in the last one. It's honestly so hard. Yeah, his his struggles against JJ, because not only is that the difference between like like a better record versus top five, but that's also the difference between between a get cooked win. You know, like like if Ryder wins at get cooked, I think this is a pretty a pretty clean argument for Ryder at four. Ryder also got double in by Savon at um, Battle Before Boise, which also hurt his season. Yeah, true, mm. true. Yeah. Good wins for Savon. Good for, good for that guy. I like Savon. Are, uh, are we... Go ahead. No, this, I was just going to say this top five is super stacked, and this is the most stacked the top five has been in Michigan for it. Right, yeah. We, mm. We've we got the Invaders. We definitely definitely have the Invaders here. Yeah, yeah. that's an awesome Ryder top five. Were two and three last season, and they both come down a little bit. Did we... Um, Suspect and Dice did so good. Did we mention in this episode already um, when we can expect the uh, official list to be out? Uh, uh, we're, we're, shoot, we're shooting for the 15th. So the 15th? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a lot of people were just busy for the holidays and just taking a minute for people to get their socks together. And we're, mm-hmm. we're also trying to put a graphic together for the first time in a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully that Don't, gets do not listen to Anthony on Twitter. Please do not. No, just no, we're doing, discard we're doing his suggestion. Um, yeah. But yeah, hope we're shooting for the fifteenth at the latest. If it's any later than that, blame Grayson. It's his fault. <laughs> so are you guys going to decide what what the theme is yourselves? Um, I think so. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Keep it a surprise. Um, so that might be a good spot to wrap up. Yeah, I think that's a wrap up. Um, about an hour in, I felt real good, fellas. Um, links to everything we talked about in the description. There's going to be quite a bit. I'll make sure to get as much of that in as possible. Um, if I forgot something, let me know. I'll add it. Um, stay tuned January 15th to see if uh, Lilac was on the money with his uh, with his rankings or if there's a bit more variance than we expect um, yeah links everywhere thank you so much Lilac for uh, yeah thank you for coming on recording for three hours and again <laughs> yes yes thank you for coming on again alright um, I think that's going to conclude a solid episode alright peace out guys Good night, fellas <laughs>